welcome to the Anxious Child Podcast, the podcast that helps you best work with anxious kids and teens. Now, here's your host, Stephen Quinlan. Welcome, everyone. We have a very special guest today. I'm really excited to announce that we have Shadayu from the Portsmouth Buddhist Center. I feel really lucky that I've been able to not only personally benefit from some of his wisdom, but also really grateful that he agreed to come on the show. You'll notice that this episode is geared less towards kids who have anxiety and has more of an overall managing anxiety feel in general. The reason for this is that one of the main ways that we can be helpful to kids who have anxiety is to make sure that we have our own anxiety in check. This makes sense clearly for the reason that we don't want to give off just sort of an anxious energy, but also, and perhaps more importantly, that we're not modeling anxious or avoidant behavior for kids. I absolutely love this conversation, and I'm hopeful that this can be really helpful to a lot of people in general, and also to the kids that are in their lives. I think we can all agree that we don't need to add any extra anxiety to our already hectic lives. And you know something that causes anxiety is clutter, especially cord clutter. Mount Genie at mountgenie.com makes clever tech accessories and mounting solutions for your Alexa, Google Home, video game consoles, and all brands of Wi-Fi mesh router networks. They rein in that messy cord clutter in your home or in your office. Mount Genie also has organizational solutions for your keys, remotes, sunglasses, and more. Most install without tools in minutes and won't cause damage to the walls. Mount Genie is a family-owned company solving your cord clutter problems. Check them out today at mountgenie.com. All right, so let's all take a deep breath and get ready to welcome Should I? Well, thanks again for being here. I'd love to just start with just a little bit of kind of your life story and background and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Yeah. Well, my name is Shadayu and that is a Sanskrit name that was given to me upon my ordination into the Trirana Buddhist order. I was ordained quite young when I was uh, 27 after several years of training and preparation. I, uh, I got interested in meditation and in Buddhist teachings at a really young age uh, when I was a teenager. And when I was a young adult, I started following through on that interest more seriously. When I was ordained in the late 90s, I, I've lived and worked in a few different situations, uh, including being a, a farmer and greenhouse manager. Uh, but from my ordination to now, I've always done at least some teaching mm-hmm. and uh, uh, co-leading of retreats and, and that sort of thing. So my my life as a Buddhist and my life as a facilitator has been pretty full since that time. And in the last few years, I've been working full-time for the Portsmouth Buddhist Center and for Arya Loka Retreat Center in Newmarket, New Hampshire where I do a fair bit of admin work and work with people and that sort of thing, but also do uh, a lot of teaching. And so my, um, fortunately my love of meditation was able to be translated into a way of teaching it in the world and a way of being supported to, uh, to do it as well. Mm. That's interesting that, you got started so young and nice that that's translated into something that you can sort of spread that message that was presumably helpful for you to, to other people. I wanted to get your thoughts around anxiety in general. I'm curious if you could speak a little bit to how you feel like a, a meditation practice or even just sort of general mindfulness can be helpful to potentially alleviating some of that. 
Yeah, sure. So anxiety is one of the root hindrances to happiness and to feeling integrated, basically. There are a lot of lists in Buddhism, and they're very useful for, uh, well, they're very portable for being in the world and dealing with various situations and finding uh, finding ways to remember te the teachings um, to put into practice. One of those lists is called the five hindrances. And usually this is talked about fairly specifically in relation to meditation practice, but there are broader implications of this teaching. And the, the hindrances are uh, ill will, so mm -hmm. various shades of aversion, and desire for sense experience. Those are kind of two pairs. And then the other pairing is uh, sloth and torpor, which can be physical tiredness, but also could be a kind of mental dullness or heaviness. And then, re and then that's contrasted with restlessness and anxiety. And then the fifth, the fifth hindrance is doubt or indecision or, or the in inability or unwillingness to kind of commit to what is present. So restlessness and anxiety covers that whole range of our experience from just feeling a bit jittery and restless physically to being uh, really frightened and, you know, even experiencing panic. But generally, we talk about it as the sort of proliferation or the, the, the habit of thinking in a particular way. It's quite often around something we feel nervous or feel fearful about. And the tendency of our minds seems to be to just keep running through the scenarios that cluster around <clears throat> that fear or anxiety. So it's kind of, it sounds a lot to me like getting stuck in that loop. Sometimes I'll hear people describe as almost as kind of like a panic loop that you you can't get it out of, you're ingrained in one particular way of thinking or focused on one thing, and it's difficult to get out of that. Yeah, so what, what mindfulness practice attempts to do and what meditation more particularly attempts to do is to create some space around that. So mm -hmm. it gives us an opportunity to be with the discomfort of anxiety, but perhaps not to react to it and perhaps even to shift how we respond to the situations that make us anxious. So one of the useful teachings in relation to that is noticing the space that exists between how we feel and our response to how we feel. And so basically the the Buddhist teaching is that in every moment when we encounter phenomena through our senses, uh, that encounter gives rise to different feeling states. And so very broadly, those feelings are either going to be pleasant, unpleasant, or nondescript, just kind of neutral. And uh, what happens with habit and with patterns of behavior is we quite often react. We qu quite often go from feeling something to doing something without really much space in between. And when we do that, it's very easy to just live life on autopilot. What mindfulness practice does is it gets into that space between feeling and response. And it helps us to develop the capacity to be more spacious in relation to how we feel. And so if, if the feeling tone that we're experiencing is unpleasant because of anxiety, uh, we may find that we start developing the capacity just to be with that. You know, as, as uncomfortable as it is, uh, just to be with that experience and to feel it. And sometimes in just doing that, we give that feeling an opportunity to move on. 
That's interesting. I, I see why <clears throat> I think Buddhism and psychotherapy have been able to come together in a lot of ways. There's so much crossover between a lot of what you're describing and what now is seen as being sort of the gold standard for treatment around anxiety, which is getting into that, just that place that you described in between when you're, you know, a feeling comes up or you're, you know, to put it in psychological parlance, like you're, you're triggered by something and then what's your response going to be? to be able to kind of uh, find that pause in there before before your action or in the Buddhist sense, almost more refined, like before your thoughts or thought pattern kicks in. Yeah. Well, the one of the key dynamics of Buddhist practice is the, you know, basically the changing of one's mind. So it's, it's understood that our minds and the habits we've developed through our conditioning are not fixed. The, the personality is fluid. So uh, when it comes to working with mental states in, in this way, it has to do with recognizing that thoughts come and go and they don't necessarily make up who we are. Uh, in in our totality, the mind in Buddhist teaching is seen as a sense. It's the sixth sense is the mind, and in the same way that the eyes perceive visual objects, the mind perceives mental objects. And so, thoughts, feelings, emotions, dreams, fantasies, all of those things are considered mental objects. And so, when we come into contact with them we have an opportunity to decide how we're going to relate to them. And uh, I know from my own personal experience that when I'm overwhelmed with anxiety, um, I've, I've basically lost space around the, the, that anxious thinking mm-hmm. and it, it's overcome me. And I find personally that sometimes that's impossible to catch when it gets chemical. You know what I mean? When it, when it actually is in the body and my, and whatever glandular processes are going on that kick off fight flight at that point there there are things that i've found i can do but at that point uh, something has happened that is uh, beyond my will to control in the in the way that my will would prefer to control if you know what i mean so a, a lot of this work has to do with recognizing at, thoughts as they arise and interrupting patterns that lead to those spaces where things really do get out of out of control almost like before the physical as you're describing process is triggered at which point you're you're in a different space completely now that those it's the it's the amygdalas in your brain which sends out that fight or flight or or freeze sometimes response um, and once that's happening i think you, you are up against a very organic process that is in in some ways i i think i don't want to say too late but like the management of it maybe then becomes different as opposed to heading it off at the pass which ideally right. you're able to do yeah. getting in between that sort of sense experience and then reaction to that yeah and i i feel like part of part of my process of getting a bit more comfortable, it doesn't quite seem like the right phrase, but getting accustomed to fight flight has been realizing that it, it's there for my protection. Yeah. I, it doesn't, <laughs> that's right. It doesn't always arise at convenient <clears throat> times and it, it's not always responding to something that's objectively threatening, I think, mm-hmm. uh, but it's there for my protection. And so that's been my way of reminding myself that it's, it's actually okay to have those feelings. Yeah, and I'm thinking about what you said earlier about how the thoughts that come in sort of unbidden to your mind can feel intrusive in some ways. And they're not, you're not necessarily responsible for those, as you were saying, fantasies, dreams, et cetera, these things that just kind of come in. I was also thinking, as you were saying that, that there's a tendency, I think perhaps of the ego to 
I mistakenly identify with those things, um, that that somehow represents you. And then potentially you can feel really bad about yourself if you have this horrible idea of, you know, what if I just sort of push that person over or something? Right. Um, so I don't know if that was something that you could speak to a little bit or that sort of tendency of the ego to try and latch on to things that may not in fact necessarily be that sort of core essence of who you are. Sure. Yeah. Again, we're, you know, we're talking about things that are essentially mental objects and they can seem terribly compelling because, you know, some of our thoughts have such strong emotional content. So I, I find in my own experience, the stronger something feels emotionally, the more I tend to identify with it because it, it gathers more of my attention. It draws more of my, more of my interest. So again, mindfulness practice uh, is about recognizing that process and remembering to remember that, okay, this is, you know, this is a thought, this is a mm -hmm. feeling, this has come into my experience and it's, it's not the whole of me. It's not the end of me, and it doesn't even actually have to determine how I behave. It, it really is just a thought, you know, as mysterious as the arising of thoughts are, um, you know, there's bigger questions there. As mysterious as that is, it, it really is just um, words that we're hearing in our head or images that we're seeing in our mind. I, I know from my own experience that if, if, I, <laughs> if I don't, if I'm having an unpleasant time uh, with something, it's going to change. Uh, it's, and it's, it's going to change relatively soon. I know that's not the same for everyone, but in, in my experience, these thoughts and feelings come and go so quickly that really I just have to pay attention to them in order to start feeling some equilibrium again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, depending on how disruptive uh, whatever I'm thinking about or feeling feels, mm -hmm. you know, obviously some, you know, things that are painful can feel very disrupting. It reminds me of that uh, metaphor of the thoughts being just kind of clouds that are passing by in a transient way and that eventually everything will just sort of pass. And then, I mean, you know, that goes for positive emotions as well. Do you, I mean, do you think that anxiety is a way of like a, a grasping that takes place in some sense in terms of maybe trying to maintain some sense of control or permanence over things that are inherently impermanent or not controllable? Yeah, so with, with that question, you really begin touching on some more existential uh, qualities of, of this. Of this type of I tend to, I tend to do that. <laughs> <laughs> In Buddhist teaching, it really, it really kind of starts with that problem with that predicament. So the, the Buddha basically said, you know, that our experience of life is inherently unsatisfactory and the reason for that is because we want things to be a particular way, but things are always changing. Mm -hmm. um, so when the Buddha talked about the nature of human suffering, he, he discussed that often hand in hand with what, what he referred to as the root of that suffering, which was craving or desire. One way of talking about what meditation does is that it quells that sort of flame of craving, which relieves suffering. And part of that is the recognition that things that are impermanent, which basically is everything we're in touch with, cannot give us a permanent satisfaction or happiness. And yet the nature of craving is to want some sort of permanent satiation and it's built into our consumer culture we're given the impression from a very young age that if you put your life together just so then you have a happy life and that's kind of the end of the story and 
we have, you know, we have different ways of talking about that through career and family and education and the, the sort of American dream that has been presented to us. And, and yet all of that is impermanent. We, we all die. There's no way around that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Buddha asks the larger question, well, you know, given that everything we gain, we have to let go of, why not just let go now? And mm -hmm see what what comes in that space and and the buddha the buddha was saying that you know his teaching was primarily concerned with the relief of human suffering and through his awakening he had determined that the way to that relief of suffering was through letting go of craving uh, mm -hmm. was through uprooting craving uh so there's there's a lot there's a lot of um implications for that in how we live our lives. And I don't think it's very black and white. I think for most Buddhists, who, you know, most people who choose to be Buddhist, it's a process of, of letting go and acceptance. But at the same time, that doesn't mean just letting life do to you what life wants to do. It, there's, there's a sort of, a sort of balance in a way between doing what you need to do to develop yourself and to develop your mind and to transform yourself um, and to become free of habits and accepting and understanding that life is impermanent and that our wills, our egos can't fix life at its own level. It's very much like, sort of meeting life where it is um, and the realities of it without flinching away too much at that, which obviously is difficult. I, I think that the tendency is to turn away from things that are difficult or to try to somehow mitigate things or make them more comfortable, um, which is, you know, you mentioned the, the sort of American capitalistic dream that we're all subjected to in one way or another. Uh, the, the, I think that plays on that, uh, that people's desire to be comfortable, to feel all these things which aren't really necessarily attainable through the methods that are presented to us, which is buy stuff, basically. Yeah. So if somebody, so just on a, a more, before I wax to uh, existential, um, on a more sort of concrete level, if somebody is feeling like they are struggling with just feeling nervous about something or feeling anxious about something, what, what would you suggest to them or where would you tell them to kind of start with that? Yeah, I, th I think we're all different, um, but I, we probably have enough in common that certain techniques are pretty widely helpful. One of the biggest things, one of the biggest lessons I think I've learned is that dealing with anxiety or fear is not necessarily about making it go away, mm -hmm. uh, or at least not in the way that we might th think about making something go away. I think in order to really sort of deal with it, we, we have to experience it and you have to feel safe doing that. You know, I, I know that this, this isn't the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we ha you have to feel safe feeling fear or feeling anxiety uh, to do this. But I think there's a lot of wisdom in just sitting with the unpleasantness of the feeling mm -hmm. um, and allowing it to move on. Like you use the image of the clouds moving through the sky. Part of what makes anxiety worse, I think, is when we try and deny that the clouds are there or when mm -hmm. we try and blow them away. <laughs> it's, an impossible, it's an impossible task. Uh, so part of it has, for me anyway, has to do with being able to sit and to feel that. But I don't want to give the impression that it's all an internal game. I talk to my friends all the time about my fears. Mm. Uh, it's actually talking to my friends about what makes me anxious or fearful has been one of the most helpful practices, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. So there's there's that. So I, I tend to seek people out when I'm in a in a bind uh, with anxiety. Mm. But the the mental work 
I think has to do with feeling how I feel, being honest about how I feel, and then using the breath to calm my body, you know, to activate certain aspects of the nervous system. I use um, not, not just mindfulness of the breath, but actually sometimes I use a bit of counting, uh, which I think is a very common technique, not, not even in just limited to the Buddhist world, but where you breathe in for a count of four and you breathe out for a count of six. And if you do that, when you're reading your pulse, like if you put your fingers on your pulse, you breathe in for a count of four and then breathe out for a count of six. You can feel your pulse slow. And what happens with me is it'll slow, then it'll go back up again. And, but um, that, that out breath can be very grounding. Mm -hmm. So you can, you know, and you can get into the habit of like feeling it in your whole body. So you, you feel it quite distinctly in your abdomen, but energetically in a way you can feel it in your nerves, in your arms and your legs. And you can feel that grounding and letting go quality of the out breath in the whole body. And I've, I've found that a very valuable technique in becoming present and in calming down. It sounds like you're describing almost a two pronged approach of being able to remind yourself to do something like a breathing exercise uh, and also connecting with other people and just sharing with them things that you're going through. I know in the Buddhist yeah. In the Buddhist world, this would be the Sangha, right? That that uh, idea of community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you you don't have, obviously, you don't have to be a, a Buddhist to do that. Right. So this yeah. is a totally portable teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think, I think taking advantage of the fact that we're not alone on this planet, we have other sentient beings to communicate with. As tricky as that can be sometimes, it's also very supportive. So, uh, yeah. Using our our friends and our support network to to find peace and ease is very important. But yeah, like in traffic or in the middle of a difficult conversation, or when you're randomly you know randomly sort of attacked by anxiety uh, when you're minding your own business, uh, these breathing techniques can be pretty important to find balance again, or to at least begin to feel safe again. Mm -hmm. Are there other things that you feel like are helpful for people besides, I mean, I think the breathing kind of is that reminder and, and even physiologically puts you in kind of a different place. Are there other things that you feel like people can, can utilize to sort of either remind them to do that or just sort of put them in a different kind of mental space? Yeah, I think, I think there's more to it. Sure. So I think during like day-to-day uh, -day life uh -huh. uh, as you're as one is moving about and you know doing everything that we do the principle of just being mindful is very important so there is a pretty rich language for talking about mindfulness so without going into too too much detail i can just say that for most of us we begin by just being more aware of what our body's doing, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't necessarily mean thinking about the body or looking down on the body from the chin up, but actually feeling the body, feeling the sensations of the body. So noticing what it feels like to walk, to sit, noticing feelings coming and going, because we experience that in the belly and in the heart, you know, just being in touch with ourselves as embodied entities is very important. And getting into the habit of doing that has a lot to do with just remembering to do it. Because mm -hmm. once you remember to do it, you're already there. Mm -hmm. If I remember to feel my body, I feel my body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's that quick. It's thought quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can do things to, to remind yourself to do that. You can have visual cues in your home or in your office, you can 
take on like a personal precept, like, okay, every time I, I eat, for instance, I'm going to really taste the food. I'm not going to be watching TV or on my phone. I'm just going to eat my meal. Uh, you know, you can take on little precepts like that. And I know quite a few people who use timers on their phone, just, you know, a little bell now and again, just a little pleasant ding, uh, nothing too harsh to, to remind us to be present. Um, that can be helpful too. And I, I think when we, yeah, when we do that, we develop a really positive habit of being present, which gives us an opportunity to notice when we start proliferating thoughts around anxiety. So that's, uh, that's kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. And then for those who do have the time and are interested in meditation, uh, a, a meditation practice, a regular meditation practice, is very helpful at really deepening one's experience of awareness. And so when we sit and when we're still and when we're quiet, we allow, we, we, or rather we bring forth an opportunity for really a whole new experience of consciousness and peace. And so the more time we can give to seated practice, I think the better. And I think it has ripple effects on how we behave more generally. Yeah, that's uh, it's certainly something that I've noticed in my own practice and, and trying to find time to do that and then eventually trying to find more time to do that. In, in some ways, it, it's sort of a, a principle, I guess, of positive reinforcement and that you you notice the difference and you're like, how can I sort of try to do that more? Is there anything you would say to somebody who is maybe trying to start as far as thinking about doing a meditation practice, but is saying, there's just no way that I have time for that. Like I can't, you know, how can I possibly find time to sit around for however many minutes? What would you say to somebody who is feeling like that? Right. So it, it would, it would depend on really the person to, to some of my Buddhist friends, that I feel comfortable saying this sort of thing to, I would say, well, maybe you need to look at the nature of your life more generally. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You don't have time to meditate. What is going on? Right. Um, but it, um, to, to people that are, that are not Buddhists who, who would just like to introduce some mindfulness practice and some seated meditation into their, into their lives. I would say that, you know, really even several minutes at intervals during the day can be really helpful. I mean, if, if you want to be really Buddhist about it, the more, the better. And, so, you know, a lot of, you know, myself and a lot of my fellow community members, you know, we meditate usually 30, 40, 50 minutes a day, uh, some people longer. But if, if that's not desirable or feasible, even doing 10 minutes is, mm -hmm. can be extraordinarily transforming. If, if anything, it just resets or it has the potential to reset you. And so if you do that in the morning, you know, just have a little breather. If you, if you're able to do that at your, you know, on your lunch break or when you, you know, wherever seems appropriate during the day uh, or at the end of the day, those can be very valuable uh, moments that can develop a culture of meditation in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, so taking time out to do that, even if it's just a few minutes, tends to start orienting ourselves towards greater depth. And whether we like it or not, there's, there's wisdom in those depths. <laughs> yeah, so just being able to go there when things are hectic at work or when things seem out of control, just being able to look more deeply to sit, to breathe can be a very good way of really transforming how, how you live. Mm -hmm. It, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of, cause I think what you're describing so nicely is just that, just like starting with whatever feels like a manageable chunk for you and just, just starting there. And that that's so much of the, the, the battle, so to speak, if you want to put it that way, is just beginning with, with something. It also reminds me a little bit of the balance that you were describing earlier of having to sort of 
straddle the fence between sitting with some things that are either making you feel anxious or making you feel sad or angry or whatever and 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 being with those things but at the same time like not necessarily getting overwhelmed by them it's like if you take these little chunks of either you know just being able to sit for a little bit with something um, or just being able to you know do a little bit of meditation that um, mm. that makes a big difference it it really does i mean i can feel that quality of being reset with just a breath or two mm -hmm. that's, that's really all it takes it, it's the uh it's the vagus nerve isn't it that's mm -hmm. active with that mm -hmm. uh with that uh, breathing technique I mentioned. I was doing it just a second ago when you were describing the four and the six out. And I was like, I mean, that'd be a good thing, actually. I think I'll do that right now, like as you're yeah. talking. But I think that, you know, shows you when you have that thought of, I don't have time or how am I going to fit this in? There's really always time. You can be in your car, you can be walking mm -hmm. down the street, but a, a, a big, a big part of it, I think is that, that initial remembrance. And as you said, it's almost like that's the, you've already, you've already done it almost as if like when you're in a, you know, a meditation and you notice that your mind is being pulled off in one direction, just that noticing is that's it right there. That was a big sort of relief for me to find that out because it can be so difficult to feel like I keep getting pulled off. I keep getting pulled off. Like I'm not doing this right. So I think a lot of people probably struggle with that early on when they're, when they're first trying to, to sit for a while. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, those of us who have been meditating for 30 years too, that, you know, we, we still have active minds. The, yeah. 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 The, the mind just does what it does. It proliferates thoughts but yeah you can get to a point where you can really quiet that and it's and really there's no question of shutting them out it's more a question of just having enough space to allow them to settle mm. it's almost like you know water that's been stirred up with silt it's easier just to quit stirring the water than to try and filter out all the stilt yeah if you mm. quit stirring the water the silt just settles in the bottom and you have a clear pool again hmm. um so that, that does take some doing that does take some time and space and yet you can feel the refreshment of that in in a moment just you know just from a breath you can you can mm -hmm. just at least touch that and remember that that possibility is there that possibility for greater depth and greater space is is available to us hmm. did you want to say anything at all about I, I know you through the portsmouth buddhist center you are offering some online classes etc that have been helpful to me personally um do, if people want to check that out where where can they do that sure so um yeah we've we've been online all year with the pandemic um we'll probably be doing some hybrid classes as the numbers change hopefully over the summer and as more people get vaccinated. But yeah, the uh, PortsmouthBuddhistCenter.com, we, we list all of our uh, current and upcoming classes on that website. And then aryaloka.org, that's A-R-Y-A-L-O-K-A.org uh, is the center in Newmarket. And we've, we also have a, an online program that's listed there. And we have, uh, both centers have weekly gatherings, either on Sunday mornings or Tuesday, Tuesday evenings, uh, which involve uh, lead meditation. So people can find, yeah, details about those activities um, at those websites. And, and you don't have to be a, a Buddhist to attend. It's open to everyone. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that sounds great. Well, thank you so much for your uh, words of wisdom. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you sharing that with us today. Oh yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun, and I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah. All right, that was Sadayu from the Portsmouth Buddhist Center. Keep a lookout for later on this week. I'm going to be also launching a 
bonus meditation episode, just about 10 minutes long uh, with him as well. So keep an eye out for that. The website for Portsmouth Buddhist Center is PortsmouthBuddhistCenter.com. There's also the retreat site in Newmarket, New Hampshire, which is Aria Loka. That's A-R-Y-A, then L-O-K-A. And the website for that is arialoka.org. Hope everybody enjoyed this episode as much as I did. So until next time, if you want to support the show, don't forget to leave us a review, get in touch. Let us know if you have any questions, things that you'd like to have covered on the show. Also on the website, if you'll see on the main page, there's a button there that I've just added that I'm excited to be launching. I'm going to be offering just brief consultation uh, phone calls or video calls for people who would like them, as that sounds like something that people are interested in. So until next time, be well, take care, and be in touch. intended as medical or psychological treatment. In no way should it replace treatment from a mental health professional.